that. Okay, we're on. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me this afternoon. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Owen Bad. Um, it seem, might seem like a little bit of an old topic, but hopefully I can spice it up a little bit for you. A um, little about me. I'm Luke. I'm an applications developer with Penn State. Um, I work on the World Campus Marketing websites. Um, we're a very large marketing department, and what I'm going to present is going to be all through the filter of a very large uh, marketing department that has a lot of stakeholders um, and a lot of stakeholder opinions on how things can and should work. Um, I am an active community member on Drupal.org. I'm Luke Lieber on Drupal.org and L. Lieber on Slack. You may have seen me around. Um, today, I'm going to talk about OEmbed itself, um, a little bit of OEmbed in Drupal 7. We're going to move into Drupal 8 with OEmbed and how it sort of came into, into being. I'm going to give an honest review of just off-the-shelf functionality. That is just straight core, no contrib, no core patches, just install it, and this is what you get. Um, then I'll step into sort of how we worked around or uh, improved a lot of the areas that both ourselves and our stakeholders pointed out to us. Um, so OEmbed itself, I'm going to discuss what it is, the problems that it solves, uh, get into how it works, and we can't talk about OEmbed without having at least one slide on security. Um, so what OEmbed is, um, this is quoted straight from Wikipedia. It is an open format designed to allow for embedding content from one website into another page. Um, two things uh, stood out to me in that sentence. Um, one, it's an open format, freely available to anybody that wants to go and learn it. Um, and the word content kind of stands out because it is fairly ambiguous. And a lot of people, when they think about OEmbed, they say, oh, well, that's a video. Well, in reality, it could be a video, it could be an image, it could be a, a pile of HTML, it could really be anything. And that's intended by the spec. Um, you can go and find the spec on oembed.com. It's all in one page. Um, read it in 10 minutes. Um, so what problems does oembed solve? There are literally thousands and thousands of content providers out there, all shapes, all sizes. Um, OEmbed provides a structure for these uh, content providers so that when you're working between multiple providers, you have a common interface to use. Um, and that does lead to a much easier to implement uh, solution when you know what content providers that you're working with. Um, it also allows for no code integrations with new and unknown providers. As long as the provider follows the OEmbed spec, your stuff should work with it. Um, and on the provider side, it's easier for them to make their content widely available because they don't have to invent, reinvent the wheel here. Um, OEmbed is a well-known format that they can just plug their content into. Um, it does operate over some really, really simple uh, and portable tooling that everybody in here has probably worked with. Um, this last point is a little bit more abstract. Um, and I worded it so that it goes, the intent to display content and the underlying implementation are abstracted. So as a consumer of content, you really don't have to care about what that content looks like when it gets to you. And really, the onus of maintaining that content really falls on the provider side. And so that means as a consumer, you have limited uh, worry about backwards compatibility because it really falls on the content provider side to maintain that. And on the flip side, content providers do have more flexibility in platform evolution, rolling out new features and bug fixes, because they're the ones that manage that content. I have one uh, success story here to link to. Um, up until oh, somewhere in the range of a year and a half ago, um, YouTube videos, for example, were lacking a title attribute in their own bed responses. Um, YouTube actually fixed that on their side and instantaneously updated any Drupal sites, any WordPress sites, any other sites that might have been using OEmbed. Um, when we talk about OEmbed itself, we really have two actors to discuss. Um, consumers, um, 
they are the parties that want to display the embedded content. That could be your website, it could be a billboard, um, a smartwatch, whatever you have. Um, if you want to think about it in terms of a client server architecture, the consumer would be the client. On the flip side, providers are the party that has content to share. Um, you could think of them as uh, video services, image services, but it really could be anything. Um, audio services, for example. Um, and you can think of them as a server in the client server type model. Um, so how OEmbed works on a very high level, um, you have your uh, website or billboard, whatever you have, it makes a simple get request to the content provider. Then the content provider sends back um, a very structured uh, packet of information. Um, it contains the requested content, um, a bunch of metadata about the content, could have uh, a thumbnail, thumbnail dimensions, um, how long your site should cache this information for, um, authoring information, and really the spec is open-ended. That's not all that they can send back, and a lot of providers actually do send back a lot more information. Um, when we talk about discovery mechanisms, um, there are two ways that are documented by the OEmbed spec itself. Um, first is via link attributes in the head sections of the provider's web page. So think of just going to YouTube, any video, open up DevTools. You'll probably find something like that in the head section. Um, a link whose type is application slash JSON plus OEmbed. And the href is what you're going to grab, plug into the Drupal OEmbed system, and the content will automatically uh, work. Um, this is actually the discovery mechanism that the OEmbed spec uh, recommends people use. Um, the second uh, type of discovery are via uh, centrally controlled provider repositories. Um, and I know that sounds a little complicated, but it's just a JSON file somewhere out on the internet. Um, the OEmbed.com ships one at providers.json. Uh, this is actually the one the Drupal core uses. Um, and that being said, custom repositories can be used. You don't have to use the one from oembed.com. Um, and when we talk about security, um, oembed, it, it's just dangerous. You, you can't trust what you're getting back. Um, so it, it does require some will, level of willing trust with a third party. Um, and you, your organization just has to weigh that trust um, based on who you are and who the third party is. Um, you can get cross-site scripting, denial of service, uh, people can steal your cookies, um, just to name a few potential risks. Um, OEmbed also does rely most, most of the time on server-side blocking HTTP calls. Um, so if a provider is slow or goes down or has problems, you could even have server-side considerations. Um, like I said before, you really can't trust what you're getting back from a provider. Um, but there are several mechanisms that can mitigate risk. Um, you can serve content through an iframe with a completely different domain as the host site. Um, in, to a certain degree, you can also set up a content security policy, um, although it is not completely effective all the time. And I'll finish it off by saying that allow listing trusted third parties, it's not foolproof. You're still opening yourself up to some level of risk. Um, getting into OEmbed and Drupal back in Drupal 7, um, we had the media module for Drupal 7, we had the media entity module, we had video embed field, um, and just looking at media for Drupal 7, it's still alive and kicking, it's still getting regular releases. Um, OEmbed support is provided by the media OEmbed module, it provides off-the-shelf support for a number of providers. And it does allow site builders to configure other providers. And, you know, it's fine if you still have a Drupal 7 site. Um, moving into Media Entity um, for Drupal 8. Um, used to be a contrib module. Um, OEmbed was sort of plugged into this through a, more or less a cloud of Media Entity star modules um, that you would need in companion, uh, as companion modules to Media Entity. Um, some support was also superseded by video embed field and another large ecosystem of 
of companion modules there. Um, media Entity was largely absorbed into core. Um, and there are migration paths to get from the old to the new that are uh, very well documented and work quite well. Um, stepping into modern times um, with OEmbed and Drupal, um, we'll talk a little bit about media in core, OEmbed functionality in core, um, how, how OEmbed plugs into the media system overall. We'll talk about provider discovery, some resource fetching, and how Drupal takes steps to um, sometimes display OEmbed content as safely as it can. Um, before I go any further, are there any questions about OEmbed so far? Okay. Um, then we'll get into extending OEmbed. Um, so how can we use custom and contributed code to um, tweak what core does it or uh, uh, make core work a little bit better along the way. And we will take a look at the contributed module ecosystem for OEmbed. Um, so going over a timeline, um, back in Drupal 8.4, we get media API support. Um, it was just the APIs. There was no user interface yet. Um, reusable media uh, shipped first time ever in Drupal 8.5. And it had a UI. That's great. Um, we still didn't have the media library yet, though. So things really um, needed a little bit more of a boost to get you know, up to snuff with some of its competitors that have had this for, for a time before it. Um, in Drupal 8.6, uh, we get OEmbed support. And we also get an experimental media library, which was awesome. Um, major, major UX improvements happened to Media Library in uh, 8.7. And finally, Drupal looks awesome, even if you put it next to all the competitors um, out there. Um, CK Editor 4, uh, back when that was still a thing, um, supported uh, Media in Drupal 8.8. 8. Um, and that was an extra yay because it's been the same user experience. The media library would work with fields, it would work in the WYSIWYG. It's a very consistent experience for both site builders and content editors. And fast forward all the way to Drupal 9.5, uh, CK Editor 5 support gets here and media library still works great. Um, so how OEmbed actually plugs into the overall media system? Um, generally speaking, from the perspective of a site builder and a content editor, the user experience, it's really similar to how documents, images, audio files, custom bundles, how all that works. Um, OEmbed is just another bundle of media. Um, you can field it using uh, customizable widgets and formatters. Um, you can map media source fields and that works great too. Um, it does plug into core via a dedicated media source plugin type, um, which is a pretty cool plugin that can be extended. Um, the metadata attributes with the media source plugin, they do align with the OEmbed specification. So any vendor uh, extensions to OEmbed, they're not going to be part of that out of the box uh, set of metadata attributes. Another really interesting point is that Drupal will download local copies of the thumbnails um, that an OEmbed provider can send back. And we'll get to why that actually stood out to me um, in a little bit. Um, off the shelf OEmbed support, it is limited to YouTube and video, and, or YouTube and Vimeo um, and core. Anything beyond that, you'll either need custom code or contrib to get uh, support for. Um, interestingly, the media source plugin, it does use the deriver pattern. And when we get into the contrib ecosystem, this becomes really important. And it is a really, really powerful tool. Um, you can add OEmbed providers via hook media source info alter. Um, and this taps into that uh, deriver pattern uh, for very, very low code 
um, custom provider integrations. Um, I've added in here, you can also extend the media source plugin back by contributed or custom code, but you, you really have to be careful with that because um, Drupal's backwards compatibility guarantees don't extend to plugins. Um, if you extend a core plugin, your code may break in a minor version. Um, getting a little bit more into um, the OEMBED provider discovery in Drupal and how it sort of wraps around uh, the concept of OEMBED and exposes uh, things in a way that the Drupal API can interact with. Um, the provider discovery in core is based on an external repository lookup. Um, it is implemented as a regular Drupal service and that is a very powerful thing. Um, services can be decorated, they can be completely swapped out by either custom or contrib code. Um, as far as the how these objects are generated, um, the OEMBED uh, discovery um, is provided via a uh, provider repository service, which sort of acts as a mediator between any of the things in Drupal that might need access to this information and the provider that exists somewhere out on the internet or anywhere else that provides the information. And it just abstracts that very nicely. Um, down here, it's, this is just one uh, path that in core that it's used by, and that's a validation constraint um, when people are going in and saving OEMBED assets. So the constraint validator is just one client of the provider repository service. Um, it's also used by field formatters, controllers, probably a bunch of other stuff that I don't know of at this point as well. Um, talking a little bit more about the default implementation of the provider discovery service. Um, the repository URL that is uh, set by default to oembed.com slash providers.json, it actually does exist in config. Um, it is set by default to that one provider um, file inside there. If you open it up, there are about 300 providers. Uh, Drupal only actually uses two of them um, in core. Interestingly, there is no UI for the setting. Um, you also can't update it via hook. Um, and I've linked here to a core issue um, that aims to solve that problem. You'll notice that I've, I've linked to a lot of the open issues that we've ran into and we've been following for uh, what, what feels like forever. Um, they're still active out there, uh, so they haven't dropped off anybody's radar. But unfortunately, a lot of these haven't actually been merged into core yet. Um, th this does mean that the core provider discovery, it is inherently reliant on a third party resource. Um, and that's dangerous for a couple of different reasons. It may block server side execution. Um, so if you do update the provider URL, make sure that you can trust uh, the resource that you set it to. Um, Drupal core does take some precautions to prevent any would be downtime. The data is cached. It, and if there is an error with cache data, it will use the cache data even after it's you know, quote unquote expired. Um, and perhaps the most shocking part um, as I was researching this is that oembed.com slash providers.json is a single point of failure for uh, Drupal core media. Um, say oembed.com goes down or is compromised for whatever reason. Um, that's the diagnostic that you get. I actually went and host filed um, oembed.com to something else and that's what happened on the front end. Um, like I said, this, it, this isn't, um, I don't think this is a very critical thing because even if a, any Drupal site has fetched this at least one time, even if it was five years ago, the cached information will still be used. This would just be basically for new sites that we're trying to reach out and get this information for the first time. Question. Sure. Um, on the 
this the server side blocking. If you're using an iframe, is that a better approach? Um, honestly, I oh the the question was that is it a better approach to use an iframe uh, to prevent server side blocking? Um, and I, I don't think that that's necessarily um, an option for Drupal uh, core out of the box. Um, this is pr primarily server to server communication. Um, so the Drupal server will actually reach out and grab this provider information to do things like input validation um, when users are actually going out and creating new um, new media entities. Um, so I, I really don't know if there's a better way to get around this, at least not with core. There certainly is with contrib, and we'll get there in a minute. Um, so next we'll step into resource fetching. Um, this is uh, where uh, a content editor, for example, they want to set up um, a new piece of uh, information. They have a URL to a YouTube video they want to display, paste it in, hit save, what happens? Um, it is also uh, implemented as a regular Drupal service that takes a URL and generates a resource object. Um, so the resource fetcher, um, it'll take that URL, reach out to the provider, YouTube, Vimeo, anything else you could imagine. Uh, it'll get that JSON back, it'll trans uh, translate into a resource object and pass it back off to the media source. Um, and that resource object is used internally by the media source plugin to fulfill the contract. Um, that, that is what it means to be a piece of media in Drupal. Um, the default implementation of resource fetching, um, it, it can and will make blocking server-side HTTP calls. Um, Core has an unconfigurable five second timeout for these calls. Um, Core also doesn't cache failed attempts. Um, so if you have a slow or flaky provider, um, say you're using something in-house that might be behind an unreliable firewall, um, you may want to uh, rethink that decision. Um, Drupal does allow the requests going into the resource fetcher to be altered by a hook o embed resource alter, uh, which is very, very powerful. Um, unfortunately, Core doesn't offer any hooks to modify the data that you get back. Um, there, there is an open issue for it, um, still hasn't been merged back into Core yet. Um, it's important to note also that Core currently only support, supports the data points that are in the o embed spec, so any vendor specific um, information is, is more or less lost. Um, but there are ways to get around that, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, now, when Drupal goes to actually start displaying this o embed content on the front end, um, it does this through a field formatter. Um, the core formatter, it does allow uh, site builders to configure a max width and height for the resource. Um, you can customize these uh, per view mode. And in Drupal 10.1, um, a control for native lazy loading was added, which was, um, in some cases, really huge for performance. Um, Drupal will serve all O-Embed content through an iframe. Um, that's following the recommendation in the O-Embed specification. However, out of, out of the box, that doesn't provide any protection. It falls on the site builder to set up the additional infrastructure to make this effective. Um, in, in some cases, and for some use cases, um, that's oftentimes a big lift, and sometimes it's just a straight up deal breaker. Um, failure to set up that uh, iframe, uh, iframe URL, um, you will get a security warning in the Drupal dashboard indefinitely. Um, just out of curiosity, has anybody in here set up this uh, domain protection? Two? Okay. That's actually more than I thought. Um, definitely a good idea if you can, if you can swing it. Um, so when it comes to extending OEmbed, um, 
there, there are a lot of open issues for improving core OEMBAD, and that's great. There is public visibility uh, on some of the shortcomings that we see. Um, and there are also contrib solutions that do exist to, uh, to make a lot of these things better. Um, and maybe most importantly, most of the OEMBAD API in Drupal is driven by services. And so that if something doesn't meet your organization's needs, you can decorate the service, you can completely swap it out with a new one, um, but unfortunately, uh, a majority of the open issues um, that I found in the issue queue and the ones that um, we've uh, sort of zeroed in on as being uh, very problematic for our use case, they are over five years old. Um, there does seem to be somewhat of um, a problem of over, overlapping functionality and contrib um, when it comes to um, either working around or uh, otherwise providing solutions for these things. And uh, at least a few of these contrib modules, they still require core patches in order for the contrib module to function. Um, so it's, it's not the easiest um, for, for new users to Drupal to set up. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to some contrib modules. Um, OEMBED Providers um, by Chris. This module is amazing. I'd recommend everybody to use this. Um, it does uh, tap into the driver pattern to support um, OEMBED providers with, um, with no code. It offers a UI to add in your own uh, custom providers. And this module can be configured to prevent that, um, that blocking HTTP call to oembed.com slash providers.json. You can effectively hard code um, a provider configuration to completely lock that down. Um, I want to give a shout out to Blazy as well. For years, uh, Blazy was just the solution for lazy loading just about everything. Um, Blazy is really highly configurable and it, it'll even work where na uh, native lazy loading won't. Um, and there were a lot of other uh, contrib modules that I wanted to include here, but uh, due to time, I don't think we can uh, talk about all of them today. Um, and I'll step next into my honest review. Um, I'll uh, go over the context a little bit, talk about what really worked well, uh, what didn't work well. So um, the main entity that I'm uh, talking about today is the Penn State World Campus marketing website. Um, there's a link to it. Um, it's a very high traffic site. Um, we have a lot of marketing campaigns that are constantly driving traffic to this site from just about every angle you can imagine. Um, my part of my responsibilities, I do have to understand the uh, marketing strategy. I do lead uh, custom Drupal development to achieve uh, the business goals. I collaborate really tightly with design, uh, UX, and accessibility to really produce the best that we can. Um, and I also help uh, maintain um, the relationship with other systems, including our CRM and analytics teams. Um, and this uh, team-based integration has been it had a very important aspect into one of our um, pain points that came up. Um, so getting into what worked well, um, OEMBED, it's extremely simple to use. It works just the same as images for content editors. Um, really, no one needed training on it. Um, the platform that the video comes from, doesn't matter. YouTube videos, Vimeo videos, it's all the same. Is a very consistent and clean UX. Um, as I said before, it's the same when you're setting up an entity. It's the same for WYSIWYG embeds, thanks to the media library. It's very accessible out of the box, which is rare to see. It does offer flexible field formatting options. Um, you can provide full width videos, limited width videos, um, to fit just about any shape and size you want on your website. Um, the biggest um, compliment that uh, I've seen from our content folks is that usage tracking via entity usage is extremely helpful. Um, sometimes we have to pull a video down off the website 
and that video might be on three dozen pages. How do you find them? Um, we use entity usage for that. And then we'll, we'll get into what didn't quite work so well. Um, O-Embed, it just destroys front-end performance. And this is really amplified by uh, Drupal's use of the media O-Embed iframe. Um, say your largest contentful paint element is a video. Um, when a page loads, we have to first load the page and then load the media slash O-Embed iframe content. And then when that finally loads, we have to load the YouTube iframe content to get the LCP element rendered. Um, and that, that's really, really hard to meet uh, Web Vital um, requirements with. Um, we also found that less than two tenths of a percent of users actually started playing a video um, in their visit. Um, but those videos that, or the users that did interact with the videos, were over 400% more likely to convert. Um, and that's, I don't want to try to imply a causality here. Um, I just want to point out that the users that do interact with videos, there are VIPs. Um, we want to make sure that their experience with our website is as the best as it possibly can be. <coughs> Sorry. Um, existing lazy load solutions, even uh, native lazy loading that was added in 10.1, it, it really can't help optimize above the fold assets. Um, when you visit a page, things will start loading. Um, in some cases, uh, we would using that mechanism, want to use eager loading instead of lazy loading. Um, and this was the main contributor to huge page sizes for mobile users on our site. Um, this is a quick image of uh, before and after. On Back in the day, I ran this on the Bartik theme. On the left, you'll see no O-Embed video. And the only change was adding a video on the right-hand side. Um, you'll notice the time to interact and the total blocking time just skyrocket. Um, uh, next up, uh, YouTube analytics didn't work um, when we moved into using O-Embed. Um, and this is a quote that we got from our analytics team. Now, what, why is every video playing from the same URL now? They never used to do this. Um, the iframe that Core uses to wrap around the O-Embed content, um, it d didn't include Google Analytics by default. Um, and organizations that have set up a different domain um, for that iframe, they might have additional troubles in setting up analytics that hook back to the site that these videos are ultimately on. Um, even if you set up YouTube analytics with off-the-shelf stuff, we found that not everything worked. Um, generic support, um, really didn't work well enough for us. The performance just wouldn't cut it. Um, we did have an unfortunate logo placement issue um, with some of the YouTube videos coming through so that we had a, a branding overlaying on top of the still in a lot of cases. Um, people really wanted to uh, configure this to remove one of those overlays. Um, there was also a really strong desire to remove YouTube branding from the player. And there was one thing that was an absolute deal breaker. Um, imagine you have a marketing website with amazing copy and an amazing video. Video gets done playing, what happens? You get a video from one of your competitors in the up next. That was shocking. And that's something we absolutely had to fix. Um, Really quickly, um, thumbnail assets, they will go stale over time. Um, and this happens because Drupal downloads a local copy, but there's no way for end users to update the thumbnail. Um, there, there is an open issue for this. I, I'm really hoping it makes it into core and I'm gonna be working on this one tomorrow in the contribution room. Um, and a lot of times the thumbnail assets that are downloaded, they're just too low resolution. Um, for YouTube, most of ours were downloading at 480 wide, um, which really didn't look all that great on retina displays. Um, finally, we found that some end users were seeing an error on the front end sometimes that looked a little bit like that. 
Um, and this is happening because exception handling uh, for when an O-embed resource can't be uh, displayed, it's being served in a, in a flash message. Um, some of the conditions that cause this, they are pretty typical, at least on our team. Um, when a YouTube video is made private and somebody visits a page, they're gonna see this if the video wasn't pulled off the website first. Um, and there is an open issue to uh, move this sort of messaging away from the end user and put it in a system log, um, which this patch was really important for us on our uh, use case. Um, so to, re to cap the review, really easy for content editors. It is accessible out of the box, hard to optimize, it's hard to do analytics, and there were just a lot of little things that piled up that um, as a developer I didn't notice, but we got back from uh, feedback from our marketing stakeholders. Um, and to the last point here, in that treating each provider equally lowers the quality of all providers. Um, that means that the, the way that Core OEmbed is set up, it has to treat all providers equally. Um, so it can't really tap into the more advanced functionality that these providers are adding on top of the OEmbed spec itself. And to get around that, about three years ago, we came up with OEmbed Lazy Load. Um, what OEmbed Lazy Load, whoops, does it tries to wrap as much of those um, those sticking points up into something that just works out of the box when you install the module. You won't need to patch core. Um, there's not any other uh, custom coding that's needed. Um, just install it via Composer. There's no other way. Um, when you install it, you get two things, OEmbed Lazy Load, OEmbed Lazy Load YouTube. Um, install it or enable it via Drush or through the Drupal admin UI. Uh, what does it do? It adds a new field formatter for OEmbed fields. It lets site builders uh, configure lazy load settings. Um, it will take steps to make sure the thumbnail assets don't go stale. Um, though they may still be of low quality. It does provide an API for developers um, through a plugin enhancer. Um, site builders, they have an option between two strategies, um, an inter intersection observer-based strategy, as well as the one we use is when the user activates a play button. And through number two, we can lazy load above the uh, fold assets effectively. Um, there are considerations to this, which I hope I'll have time to get to. This is just a quick screenshot of the uh, formatter settings. Uh, formatter settings for the other option. And this is just a, a GIF animation of what it looks like out of the box on the front end. It's, it's still a, a, a matte type of thing. The user has to click play twice. Nobody's was really thrilled about that. So we came up with OEmbed Lazy Load YouTube, which really added some stuff on top. And I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to uh, speed through this and get to the uh, the main point here. Um, we have a bunch of new uh, third-party settings that are YouTube specific that content editors, or I'm sorry, site builders can set up. Um, and these are added as third-party settings. It, it looks something like this on the field formatter. And this is the default out-of-the-box olive arrow experience. End users may never know that this is actually being lazy loaded. It just all blends right together. Um, the page is loaded, you get a thumbnail. Um, that thumbnail is high quality, directly from YouTube, never goes stale. Um, I will talk just briefly about some advanced features. We have GA support, um, which you can add in uh, just by um, a quick snippet on the side. And we also have a some autoplay support, which works around some of the double tap problems. Um, you just have to inject some uh, JavaScript into the OEmbed iframe. Um, and this works on Android. It does not work perfectly on iOS. Um, really quick through the API, we have plugin enhancers. Now, I mean, this plugin basically wraps around all the stuff that Core 
would otherwise need a patch to do. And we did this by um, tapping into the field formatter and making these calls from the formatter. You can customize the templates for placeholders, alter O-embed metadata, alter the HTML that comes back, and you can do it on a per provider basis. So you really don't end up with a big messy if, else, if, else, if chain, if say you have to support 10 different uh, providers. Um, that's just an example of what uh, a, a provider might look like. Um, for example, the YouTube provider, it will use high-res uh, thumbnails from YouTube. It will load some very opinionated styles, which if you want something that works out of the box is actually needed. Um, there are some, some bugs with O-Embed Lazy Load. We can't have perfect software. Um, I have them links to them here. And there is work happening in 2.1.x to sort of resolve a lot of the, um, the, the opinionated uh, uh, styling problem. Um, with that, that's the end of my presentation. I know it ran a little bit long. Um, do we have any questions? Jim. Um, yeah, I, I, I put a lot of stuff in my media library too for the same reasons, like Microsoft BI, Google Calendar. If I can embed it, I put it in the media library. Um, do you make a different media bundle for each type of embed? Do you try to group them like video? Video is like, it's YouTube and it's Vimeo, and I suppose it could be Twitch or whatever else. Do, do you group them or do you even try to do like one to rule them all? Like just put a URL in here, don't worry about it, we'll render it. Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, do we use different bundles to separate out providers? Um, and the answer to that from our, our side, we only deal with YouTube. So I've not had um, to, to, cro to make that decision. I think we have like a media bundle for video where we support YouTube and video. Sure. With the uh, out of the box on that module, is there any way to turn off um, thumbnail caching? Uh, the question was with the out of the bed core on bed system, mm -hmm. is there any way to turn off uh, thumbnail caching? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, Drupal will download a local copy as soon as the media entity is created. Um, the core patch does offer a UI which um, allows users to update the uh, metadata. And what was a little bit um, a little bit more tricky with that issue was that the API to actually update that was protected. So we couldn't even plumb in a, a call to it from a service. Um, without doing some weird reflection stuff, which which nobody would, in their right mind, do. Um, other any other questions? Um, using embed providers, is there a way to trigger some of the options that you might have for embedding? For example, SoundCloud has different types of players that you can select when you embed something from from your service. Um, Sure. The question was, um, when when using a provider enhancer uh, to enhance a, a service, are there any options to uh, control that provider? Um, out of the box, um, the only provider specific um, optimizations that were made were made to YouTube, and we do ship those in a sub module. Um, so, in in order to add those settings, that would have to be a uh, at this point, either a contributed module or um, I'm very open to uh, pull requests to, you know, add new sub modules for different common providers. Um, that's just unfortunately not something that can happen automatically. Otherwise, I, I'm sure Core would have done it by now. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Sure. This is something I haven't I haven't seen uh, available. Uh, we use Watson, it, it used to be IBM, uh, you know, we've, uh, we've tried embedding it and it's not that good, so we just take the embed code and just drop it in the, in the player. <laughs> yeah, and if, uh, the question I, I, or statement I think was that 
you know, sometimes Owen bed doesn't necessarily work in all cases. And so um, the actual response that comes back from the Owen bed provider is sometimes in a format that you can just grab and, and sort of put on your website. Um, there, I don't think there's anything um, wrong with doing that other than um, some of the, the, the cost of maintaining that content might go up a little bit. Um, just because uh, the, the provider's no longer in charge of you know, keep keeping that up to date with new platform features, um, removing different parts of it that are deprecating. Mm -hmm. um, but in a pinch, definitely would work. Um, any other? So uh, is the markup in the iframes then you know, retrieved by the server and cache somewhere inside Drupal and then that's sent out to the in other words, the markup in the iframe is not fetched by a, vis by a visitor to browser from that remote provider. Is that correct? Um, the, the question was uh, related to when the blocking um, uh, I.O. between uh, the Drupal server and the provider server tends to happen. And from the best I can tell, it happens on demand. Um, if you flush the site cache, there's, there's a chance that when your page reloads next and there was a video on it, you'll be the lucky candidate. Um, if an end user might visit something on the front end, they could be the lucky candidate that that um, suffers that that um, blocking I/O. Do you know where it stores that? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, the question was, um, where does Drupal actually store that cached information? Uh, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head, but I would assume that it is um, stored in a specific bucket um, using whatever cache backend is uh, set up for the site, be it database or memcache or Redis. Uh, anybody else? So three years ago, YouTube made a change and took out a bunch of own bed using Drupal sites. Is that if I'm remembering this right? Um, and the question was, uh, historically, have there ever been any incidents where um, a, a third party failure has caused widespread disruption to Drupal sites? And I, I believe the answer to that is yes. Um, there was, if memory serves, a, um, a change to the accepted request headers on the YouTube side, um, which for, I think it was about two days prevented YouTube assets that weren't cached from showing up on Drupal sites. And I think that's just part of the inherent risk that one has to accept when they're they're, they're relying on uh, something like OEMBED. Um, you know, any part of this deck of cards that falls down could have widespread sweeping impacts. But after that, there was a change made to core to catch that if it happened again. Yeah. Uh, to prevent white screen render fails, which is what we were saying. Yeah. We had to send out a mass message telling everyone not to clear their caches. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you for joining me this afternoon. It was great talking to you. Is it the red button? <laughs>